And tonight we get to hear about mushroom hunting. Spring's really a great time to be finding wild mushrooms. And Barry, I'm going to turn it back over to Barry in a minute. He's going to share some interesting photos and information about mushrooms and also tell us about some of the ones that are easy to identify and find in Minnesota. Barry, of course, is the president of the Rovers this year, and he's a longtime Rover, and he served on the board for uh, in various capacities for many years. Um, he enjoys backpacking, paddling, hiking, uh, skiing, snowshoeing, and, and other kinds of activities. And But tonight, he's going to tell us about mushrooms. He's also on the board of the Minnesota Mycological Society. So I'm turning it over to you, Barry. So there's a few uh, images of some of the uh, interesting and uh, beautiful mushrooms you can, you can see out there. So first off, I want to talk a little bit about the science of mushrooms without getting, getting too deep, but it is useful to know a little bit about the background about mushrooms. So what is a mushroom or a toadstool? You might have heard that expression too. So back when, when I was a, a kid many years ago, we used to talk about mushrooms as being the edible ones and toadstools as being the inedible ones. But that's not really very scientific and I'll talk more about that. Mushrooms, the more technical term is actually fungi. They're all fungi and there's various different uh, types of fungi. But what it actually is, it's actually the fruiting body of the uh, fungi is what the mushroom is. So the mushroom is just the fruiting body. So it's just like the apple on the tree and the rest of the tree is actually underground in the case of a fungi. And you can see this is the classic mushroom where you have a, a stem and then you have a cap and you have gills in most cases. Or you might have a large fleshy fungus or there's other different types of fungus that I'll show you also. So what's cool about mushrooms? Well, a lot of things. So a lot of them are very beautiful. Some are really strange and bizarre and I'll talk about some of those. Some are also deadly. Some are useful and valuable. Some are also essential for life on earth and some are delicious. And I'm sure there's probably some that are all of these things at the same time. <clears throat> so what is a, a fungus exactly? Well, it's not a plant. They used to be categorized along with plants, but they're really not a plant because they don't make their own food by photosynthesizing. They're more in a way, they're more like an animal because they have to actually get their food from elsewhere. And fungi was included with plants, but now it's one of the six kingdoms among animals, uh, plants, fungi, and uh, bacteria. And uh, really, they're, they're really on an equal to uh, animals and plants. And if you look at this diagram, and I've seen different figures here, but um, according to this, the biggest group of things out there are insects, but the next biggest group is fungi, which is this this big group here. They don't actually know how many species of fungi there are because they haven't all been described, which also applies to insects too. So there's a lot of different species of fungi. So this is what the uh, fungi structure actually looks like. They're a single threads that run through the ground and through other things like trees and things. And those single threads are called hyphae. And a massive hyphae is called mycelium and people might be more familiar with the term mycelium. There's also single cell fungi like uh, yeasts. And fungi reproduce with spores and here's a microscopic picture of the, of the spores. So how do fungi reproduce? They do use spores, but actually they also have sex, which might be interesting to know. So in humans, we have two sexes, and that's determined by uh, X and Y chromosomes. Now, with mushrooms, they basically have different mating types determined by one or two genes. So basically, they have the equivalent of more than two sexes. And in fact, this particular mushroom has 23,000 different sexes or different mating types. So that's one uh, kind of cool, interesting thing about mushrooms. So that must create a lot of drama, I would think. Um, and the way mushrooms 
uh, reproduce, if you see here, it's all out of sight. It's all underground. It's all in the, the hyphae and mycelium. And here's an actual video of it, of it happening, microscopic video. So that's kind of cool. So some of the other types of fungi that you might not associate with mushrooms, this one at the side here is called corn smut or wheat lacoche. There's a Spanish name for it. And this is probably the most ugly looking fungi, but it's actually also one of the tastiest if you can get over the look of it in order to eat it. There's also dry rot and wet rot, which rots wood, which is also fungi. There's yeast, which I mentioned before, which is a fungi, penicillin, and leaf rust to show some of the more uh, odd ones that you might not consider as um, fungi. And there's three different categories of, of, of fungi. There's saprophytic, which live off dead organic material. And you see these all over the place growing on dead trees and, and dead wood. And they're great recyclers. They, if, they, if it wasn't for fungi, the wood would just sit around forever and they recycle it and back so other uh, life can use it. There's parasitic, parasitic fungi, which uh, is parasitic on plants and animals. And a lot of them are pathogenic, which means they, if you get them on the tr a tree, for example, they can actually kill the tree. And then there's also mutualistic, mutualistic, where there's partnerships between plants and fungi. Particularly, you see this particularly with trees. And, and this, is, this is an example of this where they talk about mycorrhizal symbiosis. Myco means fungus and rhiza means root. So this is a microscopic picture of it where they, the fun, fungi actually, it's, um, mycelium will go into the roots of trees or around the roots of trees and there'll be a symbiotic relationship. And plants and fungi have co-evolved over 400 million years. So, you know, they've co-evolved together to, to benefit each other. And according to this figure, 90% of all plants need fungi growing on their roots for optimal health. And the Minnesota state flower is an orchid, the lady slipper, and orchids cannot grow without fungi also growing along with them. So that's pretty interesting. And they are of great economic importance. Without fungi yeast, we wouldn't have leavened bread and we wouldn't have beer. A number of cheeses use fungi in the, in the cheese making process. They also, like I said, they can do, uh, they can kill plants. And the fungi was actually responsible for the great Irish potato famine, which I'm sure most people have heard about. And there's also medical mycology. There's many types of uh, fungal infections. And there's also mycomedicinals where there's beneficial fungi, for example, penicillin, and there's others also. And did I mention beer? Yeah, there'd be no beer without yeast. And there's other uses of, of mushrooms now. You may have heard of some of these, but they've been looking into new ways to use mushrooms and to, and to have more ecological materials. So for example, there's a mycelium leather, which they're using for clothing, mycelium packaging material, because the advantage of this is biodegradable and you're not using some uh, non-reusable material and also mycelium building material. You can make bricks out of mycelium. But let's get to mushroom hunting, which I'm sure is what uh, a lot of people are, are interested in. So why hunt mushrooms? Maybe it's obvious, maybe not, but food is one thing. There's a lot of mushrooms you can find that you can eat, which is kind of cool, fun. Uh, it can be really interesting to find some of the different uh, mushrooms. There's certain, there's actually certain mushrooms in Minnesota that they don't have uh, specimens of at the U of M. So the Minnesota Mycological Society is actually on the lookout for certain types of mushrooms. Um, also photography or art, a lot of these mushrooms are very interesting looking and you can get some really interesting uh, photographs. And it's also another reason uh, to get outdoors if you need another one. 
And often you can combine it with other outdoor activities. If you're out paddling or out hiking, you can often see mushrooms uh, when you're out. So where would you want to hunt mushrooms? There's a lot of different places. Uh, if you notice dead or dying trees are often a good place to look for mushrooms. Uh, old growth forest, which we don't have a lot of around here, but we have some that's obviously older growth than others. But uh, particularly out west, they have small growth forests, which are very good for mushrooms. And you can find them in all sorts of places like fields, backyards, um, parks and state parks. And if you don't know it, you can actually take edibles from state parks. You can't take anything out if you, else. If you find an animal skull or a rock, you're not allowed to take it out. But you can take edibles from state parks. You're just not supposed to be doing a business out of it and clearing out all the mushrooms and selling them. But you can take them for your own use. Uh, campsites can be another good place to find uh, mushrooms. We've often walked around campsites and found different, uh, uh, different types of mushrooms. Uh, kayaking, I found chicken of the woods when I've been kayaking out on a lake because you see it on a tree on, alongside the lake. And the best place to go hunt mushrooms is where others mushroom hunters haven't already been. So find some original places that not everyone's uh, going to. And this is one, this is really out west. For some reason, we don't get it here. But out west, when they have a, a, a forest fire, they have an area that gets burnt over. The following year, they'll often get like thousands and thousands of morels. They call them burn morels. And for some reason, we don't seem to get that here. I don't, I don't know why, but that's a big deal because at a certain time of year, you just get hundreds of people running out into the areas that were burnt the previous season. So what equipment might you need for, to go out looking for mushrooms? Uh, well, obviously a bag to put them in. A string bag is better because if you put them in some kind of plastic bag, they can get damp and moldy. Uh, some kind of bug protection, either you know a bug net or a bug repellent or something like that, because often you'll find uh, the wood ticks and other bugs along with the mushrooms. A GPS I find is really useful because when you're going out in the woods looking for mushrooms, you just keep wandering around the woods looking for them and you, you really lose your sense of direction. So it's nice to have a waypoint of where you started from and then when you're done looking for mushrooms, you can just go back to the waypoint. Magnifying glass is useful. I have one, I don't use it that often, but if you want to look at them really closely, look at the gills. And of course a knife because it's better to cut them off. You shouldn't pull them up because you can damage the uh, mycelium. And I mentioned Minnesota Mycological Society before. A great way to learn more about mushrooms is to go out with people who already know about them. And Minnesota Mycological Society does forays where they go out into the woods and you sign up for it. You go out with a bunch of people and see what everyone finds. And if you're not sure what it is, there's probably someone there that can ID it for you because there's a lot of really experienced uh, mushroom hunters in the Mycological Society. So, oh yeah, so general rules about how to ID poisonous mushrooms. Uh, a lot of people have these rules. They say, well, if they grow on dirt or if they grow on a tree or if they're this or that, and there really are no rules. What you need to do when you're hunting mushrooms is you need to ID the mushroom down to the species. And that way you know exactly what it is. So if you hear any rules of what, what makes them safe, that's not true. So how to identify mushrooms. This is an interesting picture because you can see I've found a mouse nest with mushrooms in them before. So mice eat mushrooms, deer will eat them, a lot of uh, different wildlife will. So how do you identify what kind of mushroom it is? So there's certain uh, terms you need to know, like you hear about the cap, the stalk or stem or stipe, it's this thing. They might have a ring around the, the stalk, uh, what kind of gills they have, so you can look at the general shape of them. Maybe the color will be, be a clue, uh, whether they have gills and whether the gills are attached. Some of the gills is a little gap around the stem. And so they're not actually attached to the stem. Others, the gills will actually run down the stem. And all these are just pieces of information to help you identify them. Rings, vulva, warts. These on the cap, these things you can see up here are called warts. Though really they're just part of the original um, egg-like 
universal veil they started growing in. Uh, what is it growing on can give you some information. Is it growing on the earth or actually growing on a tree? And when is it growing? There's certain mushrooms that only grow in the spring, some only in the fall. Um, so that can, that can tell you something, I'll, and I'll show you a good example of that in a minute. So another way to help you identify, these are a couple of spore prints that I did years ago. And um, I did it on black and white paper because if you don't know what color the spore print is gonna be, if it's white on white, it doesn't show up well, or if it's black on black. So if you use black and white paper, or some people have used tin foil as well. So you just cut off the head of the, the mushroom, you put it down, gill side down on top of the paper, you put a bowl over it so the spores don't uh, blow away. And then you leave it overnight and then you see what color the spore print is. And I'll, I'll show you in a minute why that can be uh, really important. This is a boarded entoloma. And this one I misspelled on this piece of paper, but it's a honey mushroom, Armillaria milia. So let's look at some of the poisonous mushrooms. So yeah, there's the, the warning. Never eat any wild mushroom unless you've identified it down to the species, not the family or the group or anything, but down to the actual species. And join a mushroom club is the best way to do that. And there's the website for Minnesota Mycological Society. You can just put that in at Google. So here's one, one group of poisonous mushrooms are the Amanitas. And you can see how they, they grow. So they start off in this little egg type thing. And then as they grow, they change. So you gotta be really careful if you look in a mushroom book and it shows you a, a photo of what a mushroom looks like. Um, they look different as they get older. So you can see as they get older, the cap here is, it's, it's rounded in that direction. And as it gets wider, sometimes they even go the other way. So they go from convex to concave. And here's Amanita muscari or fly agaric is the common name. These are considered poisonous. Some people uh, eat them because they, they are mildly hallucinogenic. If you don't eat too much, I don't think I'd want to take the risk. But this is what they look like. And you often see these in like fairy tale books and that the red with the white spots. Um, and in Minnesota, they're more likely going to be like this. They're more likely going to be yellow uh, with the white spots. So it's just a particular way they, they normally look around here, but they are very pretty. And if you do see uh, poisonous mushrooms, you don't have to worry about it if you're just looking at them or even if you touch them, unless you, you actually eat some of them, it's probably not gonna um, do you any harm. So here's another one, Amanita phylloides, which is uh, very deadly. So obviously you don't wanna eat that one. And Amanita Besporagira, I think this is destroying angel. For some reason, the menu is right up over the, the top here. It's not moving away, so it's harder for me to see. But th this one, this is a good example of why you want to be really cautious with innocent looking white mushrooms. The type of mushrooms like button mushrooms you buy in the store, those kind of mushrooms in the wild are hard to ID. So, and there are some that are poisonous like this one. So you need to be careful with like ordinary looking white mushrooms. And here, here's another one, deadly gallerina, gallerina autumnalis. And a couple of other ones here. And, yeah. um, and here's another one that are hallucinogenic mushrooms or fungi. And this one, ergot, was the original source of LSD. Uh, so there were stories uh, back in the day of, uh, you know, a whole group of people kind of acting crazy, mass hysteria or whatever. And one of the reasons could be that their bread got ergot on it and everyone was, <laughs> everyone was tripping and acting weird. And there are uh, mushrooms like this, psilocybe out there. So there are hallucinogenic mushrooms um, out in the woods and places. Um, you obviously got to be real careful if you kind of look for them. Um, this is one's an interesting one because this is the inky cap. This is edible, considered edible, but it's toxic with alcohol. So you don't want to, if you do eat this one, you don't want to 
drink alcohol around the same time. And I don't know how long you have to wait. So it's probably not worth risking it. Some interesting mushrooms. Uh, some mushrooms grow in fairy rings, what's known as fairy rings, because back in the day, people used to think this was a sign of where the fairies had been dancing in a ring in the woods the night before, and they'd left this, this circle here. Uh, but it's actually where, as the mycelium grows out, the mushrooms uh, start popping up at the edge of the mycelium. Uh, actually, one of my neighbors has uh, these grow up in a yard every, um, every year, or a lot of years. But unfortunately, there are poisonous ones. Some of these fairy ring mushrooms are poisonous and some are edible. So again, just because it's in a fairy ring doesn't mean one thing or the other. You've got to ide identify it to the species. And here's, here's an example. This grows in a, a fairy ring. This one is the choice edible, the shaggy parasol. And this one is poisonous, green gill. And as you can see, they look very similar. The best way to tell the difference is by doing a spore print. And if you do a spore print, this one, I believe, is white, and this one is green. So a spore print is the, uh, the best way to tell the difference between these. Uh, just the mushrooms as medicine, there's a lot of medicinal qualities of, of mushrooms. I haven't really done a lot of reading on this, so I think there's a lot of claims out there. I don't know whether they're all uh, for real. So obviously, if you wanted them for medicinal uh, purposes, you'd have to uh, read up on that. Um, uh, this particular one, this one is really well is sought after and it actually eats insects. It actually will uh, parasitize a caterpillar under the ground and consume it, which is kind of strange. Um, some mushrooms don't have gills, they have pores. One big group of these are the boletes. So there's a lot of different uh, boletes that are edible. And there you can see a closer view of the pores. Some mushrooms don't have pores or gills. They actually have what looks more like teeth. I believe they're little tubes that the spores come out of. And you see a lot of different uh, shelf fungi, which you can see on the trees. And there's just some strange different shaped uh, fungi, club shaped fungi and beautiful colors too. That's why I said it's nice for photography and, and art. And some of the some of the colors are really interesting. Some of the blues, and you get these blue greens. <laughs> dead man's foot, kind of looks like it, doesn't it? And then dead man's fingers. I've seen these in the park next to the house. I don't think I don't. A lot of mushrooms too. There's the edibles, and there's the poisonous mushrooms, and there's a lot in between that you probably wouldn't want to eat, but they may not be poisonous. And there's probably some you could find that no one's real sure what they are. So, um, so I don't know whether these are poisonous or edible, but I don't think they look very appetizing. Stink horns, these are interesting. They're called stink horns because they do stink. They attract bugs by the stink and the bugs help spread the spores. So these are kind of neat to see if you ever see them. Different jelly fungi. This is another interesting one, jack-o'-lantern. This is considered, it is poisonous, but they glow in the dark. If you find these, take them in a dark room, but you have to wait a while. It always seems, when I've done this, it seems like you have to wait way longer than you think you have to wait till your eyes get used to the dark. Also slime molds. These things are interesting if you find these on a, on a tree or something. Oh, and here's one particular slime mold. So this is just one goofy thing that someone did. So this is the rail system around Tokyo. So someone had a slime mold and they put grains of oats out there in the same position of the towns around Tokyo. And they let the slime mold, it, it, it's a single celled uh, fungi, but it put these, um, sing, these strands out to the different food. So it could bring the food back to the main part of the, of the fungi. So it basically, designed a, a pattern like the Tokyo rail system. It's kind of goofy, but kind of interesting. Velvet foot, some, some, this is a choice edible. Some mushrooms are edible, but when you get them, that can be slimy, which can be a little off-putting. Okay, edible mushrooms found in Minnesota. These are mainly ones that I found in Minnesota, and these aren't all the ones you can find, but these are what I found. 
Uh, one thing that people talk about is the foolproof four, and I've also heard people talk about the, the safe six. Sometimes I see different mushrooms on the safe six list, but these are what's considered the foolproof four. The morel, sulfur shelf, or chicken of the woods, puffball, and then shaggy mane. These are ones that are easy to ID. Um, here's another one, which is in the safe six, the chanterelle. You can find these in the summer. These have kind of a fruity taste. I'm not, some people really love these. I'm not so crazy about them. The other bad thing about them, they grow in July. So if you're out in the woods in July looking for these, it's hot and humid normally. Um, this is interesting. This is lobster mushroom. What happens with this one, you start off with a white mushroom and then it gets parasitized by another fungi, this orange one and it actually gets it to form into more of a kind of globular shape and it goes this bright red color. And that way you can tell that what kind of mushroom it is because it's harder to, hard to ID when it's just the white mushroom. These I've never found, but these are, people love these, these black trumpets, but they are really hard to find because they're black or dark gray on the forest floor. I mean, yeah, they're hard to find. Chicken of the woods, these are easy to find. You can see these a hundred yards away sometimes. Bright orange on the top, yellow underneath. Um, we were hiking uh, on an extravaganza, I think it was. We were hiking in the rain and we found chicken of the woods. It went all up one side of a tree and down the other. It was just covered in these. And if you find them when they're pretty fresh, they can be pretty tasty. And you get lots of them too. Uh, giant puffball, these are kind of neat to see. If you get these when they're white, they're edible. Um, I don't like them that much. I haven't found a good way to eat them, but I've tried. But when you cut them through, you want them to be white all the way through because they'll turn brown and they'll get almost black eventually. And that's when they start puffing out the spores. So that's what I cooked a bunch up. I put them all in the saucepan. Looks kind of like tofu, but it doesn't even taste as good as tofu another giant puffball. Um, these are another type pear-shaped puffball. These are a lot smaller and I think these are real tasty. Again, you want to slice them through. These look a little too old, but you want to slice them through and make sure they're just white all the way through. And these, those are pretty tasty. Here's another picture of them. So here, this is the one that grows on earth, on the ground, and these grow on trees and these are well past it because you can see the spores coming out the top so when a drop of rain falls on them or if you squeeze them you'll see the spores shooting out like a little puff of smoke this is the shaggy mane i was talking about which is on the foolproof four um so they're very oval in shape the stem snaps really easily off off the cap and what these do, in order to release their spores, they start dissolving themselves. They start t turning to ink. So if you find these and you don't cook them right away and you just leave them on the side in the kitchen, you'll come back and they'll be half turned to ink. But they're pretty tasty. So there's another picture of them. They have this kind of, I don't know what it is, purpley, mauvey color to them. They're pretty neat to find. I haven't actually found these in quite a few years. I used to find them in my backyard. I used to find a lot in the park and then Suddenly, I mean, they just they just come and go. They keep you guessing. Purple lacaria. I found these a few years ago in the woods. Hen of the woods. And again, one year we found a dozen of these things. And these things are big. They can be four or five pounds or more. We had a cooler full of these things. And I was, I was sitting out on the deck all day cutting these things up so we could freeze them. And it took me forever. But then since then, we find maybe one or two a year. But that year we found a bunch and that was up at um, oh, Wild River State Park, I think that was. We found a, a lot of them and we've looked since and I think someone's beaten us to it. Honey mushrooms, another one you can find. This is interesting, aborted entoloma. Um, these are regular white mushrooms, but then when I think it's a honey mushroom starts coming up, it puts something out in the soil and it causes these to abort and they turn into this kind of lump. It was kind of like a big lump of bird poo. But if you find them when they're white all the way through and they don't last that long, so you got to get them at the right time, they're actually pretty tasty. Uh, elm cap or elm oyster. These you normally see growing on the side of a tree where a branch is broken off and they'll, they'll get into the tree through that, the hole where the branch was. Oyster mushrooms, 
probably you've all seen these, you can buy them in the store too. Uh, these are interesting, Heresium. This is where the actual, they're like teeth mushroom, Heresium, I think Latin for teeth. And I think almost all of these are edible. And these are amazing to see because you'll be in the woods and they'll be, you know, you'll be in the woods, it's really dark and you just suddenly see this bright white thing on a, on a dead bit of wood. Pretty cool. No, that's when I was out getting different mushrooms and there's a few different varieties there. This is another one that's interested. This is a, a fungi, it's chaga. It looks like burnt wood and it's actually really hard, but you can make a tea out of this. You can turn it into a tea and it's supposed to have a really good medicinal qualities. Now, whether it does or not, I haven't really read up on the, you know, how they've studied this and, um, so I don't, I don't know all the details. There's an example. That's where you would see them grow on a tree. These are a little bit, um, like I said, you can pick mushrooms in state parks. These are a little different because it's hard to get these off without maybe damaging the trees. And they have found in the, you know, like the national forest areas and that people just take an ax to trees to get these things. So um, they don't really like you picking these. Okay, the morel. This is what I'm going to spend a little time on. So the morel is the state mushroom of Minnesota. Morchella escalenta. There's a few different species of these, but morels are really easy to ID. They come out in the spring. They normally come out late April uh, till middle of May, around that time. They say it's when the lilacs leaves are as big as mouse ears, and there's other things they say, but it's, it's early in the spring. Supposedly when it gets to 80 degrees, the season's done. But if you see these, and I was joking earlier about having a, having a spot where you can get mushrooms every year. One time I was just across my back fence in the park in the middle of the day when I should have been working, but I went for a hike for some reason. And I saw some morels and I was seeing more morels and more morels. And finally I found like 69 morels. And this was about five feet from my back fence. And there was no dead tree there there was nothing to give it away. And I've been back every year since and found just one or two and never, but I found 69, that was amazing to find. So this is how big they can get too. Some of them just get huge. And this was found in, I think this was in St. Paul, someone's neighbor found this and they got a photograph of it. So how do you idea morale? Well, you gotta know what it looks like, but then if you slice it through if it's hollow throughout like this, nothing else is like that. Nothing else is like that. And these are real tasty too. Some people don't eat the stalk, some people do, but you don't really have like a stalk and a cap that are separate. It's just all one bit and it's hollow all the way through. So really easy to ID. With a lot of mushrooms, if you look in the books, they'll tell you what the lookalikes are, what to look out for. And this is the lookalike, the false morale but it's really not that similar. This is more of like a brain structure and it just doesn't, you know, if you go back to that or that, it just doesn't really have the same structure. Uh, supposedly this has stuff inside it, which is like rocket fuel. So this is considered poisonous. It's not, not a good thing to eat. But if you cut this one open, you can easily see it's different because this, instead of being hollow throughout, it has a lot of different, uh, different sacs inside it. So it's quite different. I think these sometimes grow at the same time, but normally when I see false morels, it's, it's not in spring in the morel season, it's at a different time. There's also a morel called a half free morel, which looks a little different. It's got a lot of stalk and a small head. And these do look a little like a stinkhorn. So this is a stinkhorn and that's the half free morel. So it do, does look a little like it. So if someone ever tells you they found a morel in late summer or fall, it's probably not a morel, it's probably a stink hog. Morels only come out here in the spring. Like I say, after the middle of May, maybe to the end of May, you're not going to see them. And I don't think you normally see these in the spring. These are normally late summer, fall. And these are kind of cool to see, like I said, but um, don't collect them and put them in your car because it's hard to get the smell out. I learned the hard way. So they, are, they do get pretty stinky. So uh, that's hunting mushrooms. So if the hunt fails, a couple of other ideas. You can grow your own. And this is really cool. I've done this and probably the money and time I put into it, it 
probably wasn't worth it just to get the mushrooms because I could have bought them for less money in the store, but it was really neat to see them. So you see them as they're actually growing. And if you see here, this is an oyster mushroom. So you can see the, the mass of mycelium and you see when they come out, they're all stalked with this tiny little head until they spread out uh, more and more. So it's pretty neat to see them growing. The other thing is if, you, if you're not very good at hunting mushrooms and you like mushrooms, try the Asian food stores. This is from uh, Dragon Star Oriental Foods up in St. Paul, if it, I think it's St. Paul, could be Minneapolis. If they're still there, I haven't been there for quite a while, but Asian food stores have a great variety of different, uh, different mushrooms that you, can, that you can try. And that is it. I am done with that. So I'm gonna stop my share and ask you if there's any questions. So if you wanna ask a question, if you want to unmute yourself. Hey Barry, how do you clean a morel mushroom to eat it? Cause I found one once and it seemed like I could never get the sand out. Um, yes, that's, it can be tricky. Uh, one thing you can do is if you dry the morels dry really well, then a lot of the stuff drops out as the morels dry. Um, or you can use a brush to brush it out. Um, some people wash them. A lot of people say you shouldn't wash them, but some people do. So that's another, uh, that's another alternative. But it can be difficult. And also some of them you find a lot of bugs in them. But uh, you should always cook mushrooms. So then at least if you eat a bug, it's a cooked bug. So um, you can tell it's a good mushroom if the bugs are already eating it. Barry, once they're dried up, how do you put them back into service, like into a tea or into a soup, like moral mushrooms? Well, if you've dried them, if you're making a soup, you could put them directly into the soup. As long as you've got enough liquid in there, they'll reabsorb the liquid. Or you can put them in warm or cold water and just leave them for long enough. Ideally, put them in, in water the night before and put them in as little water as possible to get them to rehydrate. And that'll do it. And drying seems to concentrate the flavor and it seems to work really well with morels. There's some hey, Barry, mushrooms that are best when they're cooked, right? And then they're safer. It's safer to eat when they're cooked, aren't they, most of them? Yeah, they, they, the people in mycological society say you should always cook them. There's some that if you eat them raw, you could get sick. And if you cook them, they're, they're safe. And just in general, there could be bugs in them. I mean, they, they're not super clean when you get them, if you get them in the they, woods. So it's definitely better to cook them. They grow in manure, a lot of them too. So, yeah. Yeah, that too. Barry, I think you have a lot of questions in the chat if you look yeah, through that I was too. Yeah, just trying to look through. So, puffball sliced thin and in the frying pan are good. Tastes like steak. There you go. Uh, the puffballs I've cooked, they tend to disintegrate. So they're, they're, you don't even see them any. They yeah, cook, like they cook the down little, to nothing. The little gemstone puffballs, I think, are tasty. They almost taste like bacon or something. Dragon Stars in Frogtown, Dale Street. Yeah. It's well and thriving. That's good. Yeah, I haven't been there for ages and with the pandemic. I'm always worried about these places going out of business. Um, yeah, the other thing about morales, you sometimes will find some early if they're on the south facing slope, because then they're, they're warming up more. So as the, the, the ground temperature gets to a certain um, temperature, as the ground gets to a certain temperature, they'll start popping up. And I think when we had a lot of late snow a couple of years ago, they were, they were late because I think it kept the, kept the soil cooler for longer. Is there such a thing with morels as picking them too early? I know with the competition of everyone trying to get out there, but um, you'd think you'd want them to kind of max out in size. Well, if they're in your backyard and they're really small, I'd leave them for a while and watch them. But in, in, when I've left a mushroom to see how well it will grow and gone back later, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to grow. I don't know when they grow and how quickly they grow. Everyone says they grow really quickly, but I don't know. I've never except the ones I uh, grew at home. Um, but yeah, I, you probably might want to just pick it because if, if you don't pick it, someone else will. Okay. 
Do they prefer sun or shade uh, mushrooms? Or <clears throat> it's uh, one question I had. <laughs> yeah. You would think they don't care because they don't photosynthesize, so they don't do anything with the sun. But I think it's all about temperature. But there are some mushrooms they always seem to like shaggy mane. They always seem to be out in the open. I see them out on grass, but they don't do anything with the sun, so. I don't know why they'd want to be in sun, and some you find in deep woods, so. Yeah, I guess they grow them in caves, some mushrooms, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. I so, think so, one thing that's interesting, I just remember this, if they grow mushrooms in the sun, mushrooms will create vitamin, vitamin D, like we do. So you can buy mushrooms and get extra vitamin D that have been grown in the sun. Why they create vitamin D, I don't know whether they use it. Probably not if they can grow in the dark. I don't know. So there's a question, are there any mushrooms that are toxic when you touch them? I, I don't, I don't think so. I, no, I mean, if you kept touching them and licking your finger, if you did it long enough, but normally I think to, to get poison, you gotta eat a chunk of it. And people have been poisoned here in the city, in the cities, there's cases of it every now and then. And normally it's someone who had a good, good, uh, good share of mushrooms. So. Kim, about chanterelles, cleaning chanterelles, we dry them because they they just hold the sand so easily. So we dry them and they're a lot cleaner when they get out. Yeah, sand is the worst because, yeah, if you cook up, if there's got bugs in them and you cook them well, you're not going to notice, but sand you're going to notice. You can't cook sand long enough to tenderize it. Hi, so we have a question if we were going to mushroom hunt with little ones like this little girl here that's helping me. Um, uh -huh. Other things that we should worry about as far as like poison ivy or other things that we could get into while we're watching for mushrooms? Yeah, so everything you can find out in the woods. So you should probably have, you know, long pants on and stuff like that. The other thing, of course, is, is wood ticks. Wherever you, most of the time when you find mushrooms, you find wood ticks, mosquitoes. Um, and if you're walking through the woods looking for mushrooms, just falling over because, uh, especially in summer, morels, normally it's not as bad because they're early in the season, but when everything's grown up, it's just really easy to fall over a log or put your foot in a, in a hole. But I mean, it's just the same as any, any time going out in the woods or, um, you know, going hiking or whatever, you, you just gotta be careful. Barry, did you see the movie, uh, I can't remember if it was Fungi Perfecti or the animated film on um, Mushroom, the, the guy who's Stamets is his last name. Oh, Paul Stamets, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the Mycological Society did a showing of that down in, uh, in Minneapolis. So yeah. Wasn't it, did you like it? It was great, I thought it was just fabulous. Yeah, it was amazing. There's just so many, yeah, mushrooms are just so interesting, I think. Yeah. It's okay. nice to find Thanks. ones you can eat, but they're just interesting, even if you don't find any good edible ones. So can I add something to your presentation? Sure. So it is recommended that you don't eat anything you cannot positively identify. Um, there was someone in the Mycological Society that decided, I know which ones are the most deadly, as long as I don't eat them, we're fine, but then we didn't see him for a while. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen him for a long time. So but, but he didn't, he obviously, he did live and everything, but don't go by that motto. Just if you don't know what it is, don't eat it. Well, there's another expression too. There are old mushroom hunters and there are bold mushroom hunters, but there aren't old, bold mushroom hunters. So, yeah, you want to be careful. Any other questions? Is there, uh, you're saying the spring is good for morels. Is there kind of a, a general season for, or is it, is it just not just the spring only, or is it just, I know I think you used to get puffballs later in the summer. Um, the morels is the spring for a lot of other mushrooms. They have a much longer season. Probably the most would be late summer, early fall when you find the most things. Probably fall, hen of the woods, uh, chicken of the woods you can find. We found chicken of the woods up north as early as June. So you can you can find that quite a bit earlier. <coughs> but fall is probably when the most are out late summer and fall. 
Chicken of the Woods usually grows on oak trees, right? Dead oaks. Yeah. yeah. The one we found some on Oak one. Island in in the in the Apostles. It's really cool. The only one that the Mycological Society used to hunt for in the winter was Chaga, because you can see it easier in winter. When there's, you know, you can get into the woods easier when there's snow, and then you can you can spot the Chaga on the on the birch trees easier. Any other questions? Yeah, this is, this is Tim. I, I, I want to thank you so much for your presentation. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, hey, hey, Barry. Yeah. This is, this is Carlene. Um, in Ohio, I find them <clears throat> most typically among poplar trees and buckeyes and occasionally cherry. I wonder if you've noticed any particular association with trees here in Minnesota. Is this with morels? Yeah, sorry, with the morels. What else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought morels were elm trees, right? Well, here it was elm trees, and when all the elm trees were dying off because of Dutch elm disease, you could go find an elm, and an elm has a specific look to it. It's like a, like a, a brush, like a brush sticking up like that. broom. Broom, yeah. Like a witch's broom. And when the, uh, the elm trees were dying, they get to a certain stage before all the bark's falling off and you could find a lot of morels. Unfortunately, by the time I started looking, I think most of the elms were dead and gone. So now you don't have such an easy way of finding them. And we found them in odd places. We found them amongst sumac. The ones, that, the most I ever found were in the park and there was no particular tree there. It was just a bunch of brambles and other stuff and shrubs and so cottonwood we've found them oh yeah i found mm. some under a cottonwood in fort snelling a cottonwood that had fallen over and then been cut off um so yeah there's supposed to be associations with certain trees but i don't know it doesn't seem to always work out that way i found a bunch under a big old white pine in my parents uh lawn you know the rest of the lawn was just regular grass I was kicking them away at first, and then I realized, oh my God, what have I done? Uh, question I have for you, is there an app or Peterson guidebook that you prefer, that you recommend? No, I got a bunch of mushroom books, but I don't use them that often because it's, it's, it's kind of hard to ID them right out of a book. And now with the, with the internet, and as good as the internet is, and Google is now, I mean, just put in the name of a mushroom and you can find probably more information about it on the internet in three minutes than, than paging through a book. I mean, that's not very good for the publishing industry, but it's, it's so much out there. Because a lot of books, they'll have one photo of a mushroom and you can't tell a mushroom from one photo because it depends how old it is. And so I, I haven't tried, um, I use iNaturalist with a lot of other plants. I haven't tried that with mushrooms. It probably works, I would think. But that's been great with other things in my backyard. Now when things grow, I use iNaturalist to find out whether it's native or whether it's something I want to pull up. Um, and that probably works with mushrooms. And there's probably other apps out there, but I haven't used them. Oh. So Jim has a question. Is there any nutritional value in mushrooms? Jim, just bring us all your morels. We'll eat them. Yeah, I, I think there I, I think there is nutritional value. I don't know the details. Um, but yeah, I, th I think there is. A lot of people uh, eat them. Animals eat them too. I know the chicken of the woods tastes like chicken and the lobster ones taste like lobster. So they're kind of, you can, they're almost meat substitute, right? I think a lot of, uh, yeah. A lot of vegans use them for t for meat substitute. Yeah. I don't know that they have the same. They don't have the same nutrition, of course, as they aren't going to have as the protein that meat does. Yeah, Gretchen's put something in in into the chat. Low in calories and fat and cholesterol free. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to call it done on the question.